In the face of an unpredictable future, we are all called upon each and every day to think of out-of-the-box ways to tackle challenges to our environment, well-being, or the many beneficial uses of an outdoor pizza oven. Welcome to the Grand Challenges Podcast, a show about inspiring individuals who are stepping up to these challenges and are here to share stories about their own personal journey towards making our world a better place. I'm your host, Peter Marcus Bach, a poor caretaker of houseplants, but with a passion for connecting across expertise and providing you access to knowledge from the cutting edges of science, engineering, technology, and design. My guest today is Dr. Daniele La Cecilia, a postdoctoral Marie Curie fellow at the University of Padova, Italy. Daniela specializes in understanding the fate of plant protection products in the environment and ways to support better awareness around and improvements to how we grow our world's food. Today on the show, we explore how Daniela's global journey has helped him to acquire his interdisciplinary skill set and combine his passion for water and food. Starting from his hometown in Modena, Italy and venturing across the UK, US, Australia and Switzerland, we discuss technological progress that will shape agriculture's future. Detailed information is provided in the show notes over at peterembach.com slash podcast. Thank you for joining and please enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, Daniele. Thank you very much for having me, Peter. Happy to have you here. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about, I guess, agriculture, house plants, and all the sorts of things. Let's go then. Let's go then. Well, I guess slowing things down, I think the one thing I really want to know from you is how to take care of houseplants. You seem to have a a penchant for taking care of houseplants. I'm terrible at them. I think I've built more Lego houseplants than actual real-life houseplants. Uh I guess natural plants are more difficult than Lego plants, yes. I don't know, when typically when I buy a plant from a gardener and so on, I just ask suggestion to the gardeners and they're very happy actually to explain you how to let them thrive and survive. They care about their plants, actually. And there are also like labels when you buy a new plant and they give you tips, uh, like how much light the plant should need, how much water, how often. And also it's plenty of blogs on the internet. And if your plant really goes in distress, then I typically take a picture And I just go back to my favorite gardeners and show him the pictures and they will help me to provide with nice tips and personal tips, most importantly. Okay. Actually, I heard there are apps nowadays where you can take a picture of the plant and the app tries to identify what it is and in what state it is and then gives you suggestions. Is that true? I saw an ad of an app like that. I never used it. But from the ad, they were like, just take a picture and I will tell you if it needs uh, more water or a different soil or a higher temperature. But uh, I never really tried, actually. But you had a lot of these houseplants in Italy, I believe, and you've moved to Switzerland and now you've moved back to Italy. So uh, did they come with you? This is sort of traveling greenery kind of thing, nomadic greenery, maybe even. (laughs) Um, They stayed in Italy. The plants I had in my apartment, they were just moved to our parents' house. I don't know if there are regulations when you bring plants from one country to the other. I guess there are. So that's I, I wanted to avoid that. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, just in case, just in case. You never know. Exactly. But apart from normal plants, I guess you also grow your own vegetables, I believe. I'm trying. That's an experiment. A couple of years ago, I succeeded very well with tomatoes. Okay. I mean, the taste was just amazing. And it goes very well with the balsamic vinegar that we produce in Modena, where I'm from. Ah, you produce your own vinegar. Yes. Okay. We are also trying with salads that also goes well with vinegar and other kinds of herbs like mint, basil, rosemary, and they just bring a lot of flavor in your recipes. So I guess, you know, it doesn't matter what you grow, talk to the local gardeners, look at the labels. I mean, I, I tend to read them and attempt to follow them, but I don't know if I really do. And I guess... I had a guest on the show before who said you can also sing to your houseplants. So at least we uncovered that myth of singing to your houseplants. Do you do that yourself too? I don't sing, but I heard that actually plants like vibrations. Uh So it might be true. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, listeners, check out episode four if you want to know a bit more about that, uh, that myth and vibrations as well. But I guess moving on to the more food side of things, I was wondering what your connection to vineyards are because looking at some of your work you were doing some studies in vineyards and i was thinking wine but you mentioned vinegar and i believe that's also produced at vineyards or from grapes yes exactly peter balsamic vinegar comes from grapes and there is just a slight difference in the making so when you 
get your grapes from the vineyard, you squeeze them, you get the juice or the must. And when you want to make balsamic vinegar, you need to slow cook it. With wine, you don't do it. Okay, so that's that slight difference. Exactly. I guess there are others during the process, but this is the initial difference, I would say. Now, this, all this food talk is starting to get me hungry. <laughs> but I guess it's very well connected to your country of birth, your origin, and your background, which is in Italy. You grew up with balsamic and making balsamic vinegar throughout your childhood. That's right. I remember I was six years old and we just moved to a new house. So we moved from an apartment to a house and my father got this battery to make balsamic vinegar. It was a battery of six barrels. So for the Modena standard, it's pretty small, but it's enough to make a nice production for your personal use. But I wanted to know where the balsamic vinegar comes from. And so I went directly to the farmers who takes care of the vineyards and make the must for us. And I asked him and explained me the whole process. So starting from the grapes, as I said, you squeeze it and you slow cook it. And then you need to add acetobacter. They love the sugar that is contained in the must. And they're just going to give you back some of the acidity that you like in your vinegar. And then it's all about patience and time, because then you leave them in the barrel for at least one year. But the older it is, the denser it becomes. And for us, the taste is just amazing. Even more enjoyable. Yeah. It's acetobacter. I guess that's where the name derives from in Italian, right? You call it aceto balsamico. Maybe, yes. Yeah. Uh, there are also different types of vinegar, like made out of apples. And I guess the process could be the same, yeah. And so vineyards, yeah, I guess that's one element that reflects your childhood, reflects your culture. But I guess one thing that puzzles me or at least we're trying to draw that connection, is you're actually researching in topics related to water. Okay, we need water to irrigate our vineyards, but you actually worked in river engineering. And when I looked at your bio and some of your interests, you actually had an interesting fascination for the old ancient Roman water infrastructure. Could you tell me a bit about that? That's interesting. So, well, perhaps our history is biased as Italians. We have Roman buildings and infrastructures everywhere we look. But actually, my passion began at school when the teacher told us about the possibility that lead poisoning, with lead being used in pipes, caused the fall of the ancient Roman Empire. Okay, so it wasn't power struggle or anything of that sort. It was just a chemical in the pipes. Exactly. And from that moment on, I revisited the topic. And so I went to look into the aqueducts, the cisterns, where they stored the water underground. And this is actually a very current topic, I would say, because we are facing water scarcity and Romans knew that if you want to store water, you have to put it underground. And that's where they put cisterns and so on. Yeah, if you keep the water underground, you're kind of storing it in a way that is resilient to a lot of the climate that the area was facing exactly. during the time. So the temperature is colder, you don't have sunlight, so you reduce to a great extent evaporation. So you keep the water on the ground instead of returning it back to the atmosphere. And the Roman Empire expanded quite a lot in the Mediterranean areas, so where the climate is mostly arid and semi-arid. So I guess they had to find measures to become resilient to water scarcity. And maybe we should learn from them. Definitely. And there's a lot of ruins nowadays that you can go visit. And we have to visualize just the size that the empire grew to because you can find ruins all over Europe. Is there a good reason why you should keep visiting each aqueduct in every single city? Well, of course, like one city is going to tell you, I have the highest. and <laughs> ah, We have the oldest. There you go. Or the most advanced. Oh, yeah, the biggest. And so many different options. Or mine has the highest flow, you know. Oh, okay, we're getting into details now. In a way, a lot of ruins spread through Europe, but still something we can definitely learn from and perhaps draw inspiration from because I guess they're each unique in their own way. You had your food passion, you had your passion for water and the fascination with how the Romans used to manage the water. But you actually ended up starting with river engineering first. You actually did your bachelor's in environmental engineering in river engineering. How did your journey start there? You began at the University of Trento. Yes, correct. So basically, there are many winding routes in my career. Well, actually, I wanted to be a marine biologist, if I have to be honest. I love just swimming and snorkeling and yeah, I also did some scuba diving, like very little. 
And at the moment when I had to decide which university studies to pick, I saw a documentary about the construction of artificial islands that basically were destroying coastal habitats. And the authors of the documentary explicitly said that marine biologists could not stop it. Okay. And so I just thought that as an engineer, I could have prevented that or at least suggest solutions, technical solutions to combine human development and a good habitat also for marine lives. I guess in a way, coming in from the other side in the project management or even showing that the project may not be viable, may not bring the cost benefit that was initially anticipated. Correct. Certainly more broad and diverse than I guess making balsamic vinegar, even though your passion for that, I think never died. I think you wanted to bring some at some point to share. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> I will, I will. So we just made the new batch and um, yeah, just wait a couple of months, it will be ready. Looking forward to that. I have to come visit in Padova, which is where you are now. But okay, so marine biologist, which is very different from being on the land, but I guess you can sort of understand the fascination with water. Mm -hmm. So you decided to then pursue engineering given this documentary influencing a lot of your thinking about where you want to be, the kind of change you want to bring about in the world. Exactly. So this documentary was one inspiration. And the other, I would say, was more vocational. So a reinforcement experience that happened during my university studies. Because unfortunately, water can give life, but can also take life. And we know that fluvial floods are a huge global issue. And in particular, in my hometown, Modena, in Italy, there was a flood during my studies. And of course, you saw the misery that these floods can bring to people. Mm, definitely. And when they went to the root cause, actually, of this flood was basically because a riverbank collapsed. And this was due to the presence of nests of animals, of rodent animals that were living close to the stream. And they make their home in the riverbanks. And this created holes and weakened the riverbank. I know that beavers, for example, will build dams along rivers and stop the waters or disrupt the flow to a certain extent. But riverbanks can also be homes to certain animals that, in your case, I guess, as you've just pictured here, may also have some potentially disruptive effect on efficient flow. Exactly. And so I decided to study river engineering for this reason, to study hydrometeorological risks and finding mitigation measures to prevent this from happening. And I guess nowadays when we think about these aspects of river engineering, we also think of more nature-based solutions, which also target the biodiversity aspect. In your case, given your interests, it was also a case of you want to find a solution that can provide the habitat for these animals here, but without disruption to the service that we need the river to provide, the protection as well that the riverbanks provide. Right. And the term NBS actually sparked in my university career, thanks to the passion of some professors. They were talking about morphodynamics and they were showing us pictures of how beautiful large streams that can meander are. I guess that's a key principle as well when we're talking about renaturalization of streams or at least engineering, if I can say that term, our rivers to be a bit more sustainable, efficient. Exactly. And following the passion of this professor, I took an Erasmus exchange during my master. I went to Aberdeen University, where I took classes on sand dune restoration in coastal areas and also river ecology. In the first class, we did field trips and the teacher showed us what's the advantage of having these natural systems to protect cities from rising sea level. And this is a lesson that I took home and I wanted to bring it exactly to Italy. River engineering, hydraulics, understanding this idea of managing the rivers, I guess through traditional but also these more nature-based means. And with that, you then went back to Italy. So you concluded your studies and, well, you know a lot more about the water side of things. But I guess, spoiler alert for listeners, Daniela knows also a lot from the agricultural side, which is where I'm trying to now find the bridge. So how did that then proceed from there? You had your river hydraulics knowledge. And so what happened next? Right. So that is when aspiration meets real life. So after finishing my master thesis, I did it at Boston University. So again, 
I investigated through the use of satellite imagery how vegetation was changing in a swamp area that was not receiving enough water anymore because mm -hmm. humans dammed the river. Yep. And so after finished that research, I got a working holiday visa to go to Australia. Oh. I was applying for positions as engineers to work on NBS in coastal areas. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. For people who don't know working holiday visa, you are allowed to work for only six months at the same company. And I guess engineering companies don't want to invest in a person that then has to leave. And so I found a job in north of Italy at the URAC Research Center, where we were monitoring important environmental parameters in agricultural landscape in the alpine environment. Uh -huh, I see the agriculture connection now. There you go. So you learned your river hydraulics. I guess you had modeling skills as well to be able to simulate what will happen. You applied this to the case study on the swamp in Boston when you were doing your master's. And there you mentioned remote sensing. And so slowly collecting skill sets and now being able to revisit your passion of agriculture and I guess balsamic vinegar. Yes, it was really, really an interesting period. We spent a lot of time in the field talking to farmers, looking at data. And that's actually where I also confronted myself with the word plant protection products. Of course, like the area is limited in alpine areas and orchard production was, I would say, quite intensive. And they resorted them to these chemicals to boost the production and maintain the production. This would be a good moment of clarification as we are getting into terminology and subtle nuances between different terminologies. You sent me this page from the European Food Safety Authority and it nicely illustrates the difference between what we call a plant protection product and the more common term, which is used often as a synonym for it, pesticides. What differs between them from what I've read is that pesticides also covers products like biocides to control for pests and diseases and disease carriers like insects, rats and mice. Whereas the composition of plant protection products often involves substances like herbicides, fungicides, possibly insecticides, but also more oriented towards growth regulators and repellents. In short, I believe they're there to keep crops healthy and prevent them from being destroyed by diseases and infestation. And the compounds you work with are not targeted specifically towards pests. That's right. If you go more into the regulations of these compounds, they are technically called plant protection products. Important and timely to distinguish between pesticides and plant protection products. I guess pesticides has a negative connotation to it. When people think pesticides, now with the whole organic movement, People say pesticide-free. It's trying to you know, evoke a sense of positivity. So I guess the word pesticide itself is... Yeah, yeah maybe it's negative. Plant protection products, it means I'm protecting the plant. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting way of using terminology to, I guess, take a neutral stance. Mm -hmm. But we still need some form of plant protection, right? Because I guess if we just grew our crops in a widely open field they're always going to be susceptible to pests or diseases or anything like that, right? Right. So I like to see at plant protection products and plant a little bit of the same as humans and antibiotics or a vaccine. So if you take humans and they live a healthy life, a balanced diet, maybe you don't need to get antibiotics to feel better. And the same would be for plants. But of course, something can happen. For example, you are in the field and you cut yourself and, for example, you get tetanus. I mean, then I'm happy that we have the cure for tetanus, we have a vaccine. And the same is for plants again. If there is a strong wind, a hailstorm, and they get damaged, then fungi have an easy access to the internal structure of plants and that's why they need to be protected. The point is always use them when you really need it. And that's actually the way that most of the farmers are following at the moment. Okay, yep. It's called best management practices. Yep. And so basically they use plant protection products when they're needed. So there are forecasts now that tell you when a possible pest invasion is happening. And so in this way, they try to limit the use. I guess everything is good in small doses, but don't overdo it. We need to strike a balance. Right. And I guess there are some horror stories of pesticide use and I recall the one from one of my previous guests in episode 5 Peter van Rollerum who told us about the experience he had visiting a banana plantation in South America and yeah if not applied or not used properly it can have very devastating effects 
And I guess in your case also, you are interested in how these, first of all, I guess the application, but then also what happens to these plant protection products or PPPs, I like the acronym by the way, as they're traveling from fields down to when they're completely biodegraded. Yes, so that's where actually my PhD journey started. So after being at Eurac Research, I went to Sydney at the University of Sydney to study how these plant protection products, especially work on the herbicide atrazine and glyphosate, how they get biodegraded in the soil. As I mentioned, like I wanted to be a marine biologist, so I tried to bring biology in all Somehow my studies. Back into the studies, yeah. And it was really interesting to study glyphosate because it is the most used herbicide in the world. The documents that were supported during its registration basically revealed its low toxicity. It's very effective on a wide spectrum of plants. And so being an herbicide is less toxic than others. I guess that's a business case for people to then use it more. Yeah. But as far as I understand, and we had some conversations and some of your works talk about this as well. On the one hand, there's still some uncertainty around glyphosate's toxicity to humans due to limited evidence on real-world exposure. The International Agency for Research on Cancer, in an article you sent me, IARC classified it as probably carcinogenic to humans in a 2015 monograph, whereas more recently the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency said it was not likely to be carcinogenic. But more importantly, on the other hand, it's not just about the toxicity of that particular plant protection product, glyphosate being the most common herbicide. It's actually also the potential risk that during biodegradation of these particular compounds, new compounds that may be even more toxic may form. You're right. So glyphosate is a very good example for this. So I studied the whole bioreactive network of glyphosate. And by doing so, we took published paper on the biochemical reactions that glyphosate can undergo when it is in the soil. And bacteria can use glyphosate in two different ways. Because also in episode five, Peter told us that pollutants are actually nutrients for some of our bacteria that we find in the environment. And this is the case also for glyphosate. It contains a little bit of carbon, phosphate, and nitrogen. And so depending on what the bacteria needs, it can decide if he wants to use it as a carbon source or as a phosphorus source. When it wants to use as a carbon source, then it produces a transformation product that is even more persistent and more toxic. When it wants to use it as a phosphorus source, it produces naturally present compound, and so it doesn't constitute anymore a risk for the environment. But what is really interesting, and now we are back to biology, is that apparently inorganic phosphate present in the environment can inhibit this second pathway. Aha, uh-huh. so you have a few pathways that are identifiable, but then they are, of course, roadblocks, if we put it in simple terms. Yes, and it sounds like it emerged that it's a survival strategy of microorganisms Because every time you want to degrade something, you need to invest energy to produce the enzymes and so on. So if they have already inorganic phosphate, that can be easily incorporated. And phosphate is at the um, base of life. It constitutes our DNA and the same is for other organisms. And so every time they can save energy, they will just do it. And I guess it's a finite source in this world as well. So call it resource scarcity. Microbes will try and find it where possible. Yes, we should learn from them. Yeah, no, scary news as well when we think that not everything is infinite on this world. Right. But nevertheless, you're reconnected with your childhood love for balsamic vinegar in the form of working in vineyards or at least investigating this kind of process in vineyards as well as wheat fields as far as I understand from one of the, the key publications that you wrote on the topic. True. And I just love biology so much that we did another modeling study. And Peter, I want to ask you, if you like salty food and you're given a meal and a dessert, which one do you eat or at least which one you start from? Wait, you're asking me questions now? Okay. Of course. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah if, I, if I like something and given the other choice, so if I like salty food and given the choice, would I do that or have a dessert? I don't generally go for desserts. I, I like to enjoy more of my 
people call it roast pork or a nice steak. There you go, you see? Ah, okay. And well, from the data I was able to compile from other publications, it looked like microorganisms are not much different from you. Oh. It turns out that they start eating their preferred molecules and then they need some time to switch to a second, less preferred molecule. And they have a memory for the molecule that they were eating. And these mechanisms allow them to save energy. You need to produce enzymes uh -huh, and yeah, so yeah. on. So for them, it's an energy saver. Okay, so they're just trying to be efficient. Yeah, super efficient. That's interesting to hear. So we, after we finished and we completed this uh, bioreactive network, we introduced it in a numerical solver where you can apply boundary conditions like rainfall, irrigation, and you can say when this herbicide is applied. And then you solve physical laws through numerical schemes that indicates how all these processes feedback on each other and so how water moves in the soil and how it can transport these compounds. And so you can predict more or less well, when and where these compounds are going to end up in okay. the environment. So in a way, using a model to understand how we can better manage the doses we want to apply and what the potential consequences are so that we can take precautionary actions as a result of them. Yes, this is the ultimate goal, I would say, of using models. We can understand that intense rain events are those that cause a higher transport of these compounds, these contaminants, away from the soil and that's where they are applied. And so we can sort of avoid applying these compounds just before a rain event. We can wait for um, a dry season. You mentioned also that it's actually a bit more tricky to monitor the dry periods, or at least we just don't have enough information or understanding of what happens to these compounds in the dry periods compared to the wet periods. Yes. So after we developed these models, and I was really excited because my supervisor during my PhD was able to develop this global gridded application rates of several plant protection products. And trust me, when and how much it is applied, it's the, one of the largest uncertainty when we do these kind of simulations. And these data are not typically available. Okay. Right. So when he managed to compile this information, we then ran our model at a global scale. Global being, I guess, the entire agricultural area. I guess when we're talking water flows, application of tracking the flow of fluids through a landscape, I guess we'd be talking the whole river basin. We were looking at uh, soil contamination and groundwater contamination. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So that makes the situation even more interesting because you have to look at what's happening on the surface the field itself, but then also what's happening on the subsurface. Yes, and this is what you can do with a model. But to reply to your question, yes, I was really excited when we got out with this study, but then I started wondering, okay, are there other processes? Do we have enough data to validate what the models are telling us? Yeah, you did mention that concern, and oftentimes when we do monitoring as well, I think more often than not, we will find a lot of data during wet weather periods because rainfall stations are everywhere, climate stations measuring anything related to moisture. Yes, we'll get some information in the dry periods, but most of it will be richer in the wet periods. So you did your PhD in Sydney, and by this stage, you had your river engineering, hydraulic background, the ability to model processes. You added to those when you were doing your PhD, so in a way, adding the, I guess, the water quality side to it with these plant protection products as well as the groundwater, because you also included that as well. There was a bit of that during your study with uh, Swamplands in Boston. And you also had some remote sensing uh, skills as well. So being able to observe a process remotely through satellite or through any other means like aerial imagery and so on. But I guess remote sensing in this case is not exactly ideal for monitoring these kinds of processes with plant protection products, right? I've never found a paper where they were saying we can monitor plant protection product applications through remote sensing. And this is where you then decided to pursue a postdoc in monitoring in Switzerland. Exactly. I saw this opportunity at EAVAG. The Swiss Federal Institute for Aquatic Science and Technology. And the project was just amazing. Because Switzerland has this vast monitoring network to monitor water quality and plant protection products concentrations continuously, 
It was a, a really nice collaborative project with cantonal authorities, experts in uh, analytical chemistry. And so I felt like I could contribute and I could also learn a lot from them. A really good composition, actually, because it really touches upon the essential aspects. Definitely. You got the decision makers or at least the governance aspects through the authorities. And then you had the analytical chemists, because I guess you're the biologist here, given your passion for that has never died throughout your career. But yeah, you need the chemical side as well. For accurate measurements, yes. Yeah. And the most amazing thing was to work with MS Tufil that was developed within the environmental chemistry department at EAVAG. So MS Tufil is this trailer that contains an analytical lab that you can bring to the field and it will just sample water every 20 minutes and it will process the sample and it will give you a concentration. So it's... It's really just like this mini container, looks like a caravan it with is. a door with all the equipment inside. Exactly. And you haul it out to wherever you want to monitor. And it will just run continuously and automatically. And you can control it remotely. So Heinz Singer, thank you very much. It was really nice to work with the data provided by ms to field Very fascinating piece of equipment. And they made a very intelligent choice. So they located ms to field next to a Swiss monitoring station. And so I could also compare the difference in the information that a monitoring scheme like the one that can achieve ms to field as compared to another monitoring scheme. More conventional, currently practiced kind of scheme. Exactly. I must say that the Swiss monitoring scheme is really good if you want to do monitoring and modeling. It's much better, let's put it in this way, than what the European Water Framework Directive prescribe. So the directive basically set out a set of rules to halt the deterioration in the status of the European water bodies. These rules also support to achieve a good status for Europe's rivers, lakes and groundwater. I remember they always use the keyword good ecological and chemical status. Yes, but what this directive prescribes is to take a sample every three weeks. Uh -huh. And in Switzerland instead they get a time composite sample every 3.5 days. So basically in one sample you have the average situation of what happened in the previous 3.5 days. I remember working with composite samples because I'm not as well experienced with I guess monitoring and all the aspects related to that but yes I guess you can get an average of what's happening over a, a longer term period in a single sample by taking portions of it in its sort of set intervals. Am I right to understand that? You are right. Yes. Yeah. That's actually how it works. So there is an automatic sampler. Mm -hmm. You can set the interval, how frequent the sampling of these water bodies should be. And in the end, you will get your average sample. And so MS2 Fields was able to do this at a much higher frequency. Yes, it took a single sample every 20 minutes. Oh, so wow. exactly, it's just a snapshot of what was happening at that moment. So the resolution, the temporary resolution that MS2 Field achieved was just amazing. Mind-boggling, I guess. Yes. And so how did that make you feel? You felt you had gained more confidence in your understanding about the processes? Did you feel like you have to go and revise the kind of approaches that you have developed so far? That's a very good question. What we figured out is that there are a couple of processes that our models do not take into account. For example, we saw very quick early peaks after uh, rain events. And this could be due to the presence of tile drains under agricultural soils. And that's exactly their role, to drain water fast so that farmers can go into the field earlier. Let's okay. say. And actually there is a um, PhD thesis now by Urs Schonenberger, who showed in a more detailed way that there are, he called it hydrological shortcuts. Uh -huh. So there are these inspection holes or manholes in agricultural catchments where water flowing on out of the field, on roads, they get collected. Then this water is just delivered to the next streams. So in a way, more efficient drainage. I'm sensing, again, we're sort of touching upon this optimization of the process, this optimization of how we talked about it earlier with modeling the pesticides to understand when and how much to apply. Now we're trying to understand that with the monitoring. And so, in a way, this also reflects the changing and the evolving environment of agriculture where we're really moving towards this high-tech or even call it low-tech but low-energy approaches. But it's really sort of situated around this idea of optimizing. Where are we heading 
in terms of plant protective products, management of agriculture. Uh, you mentioned best management practices earlier, but I guess no practice can be really seen as best. There's always ways to improve it. And here we're seeing that. Is optimization the way forward? Uh, yes. Okay, here there are two possible ways. Of course, best management practices. We also have the Farm to Fork Directive promoted by the European Commission that states that 25% of agricultural lands in Europe should become organic. And so where plant protection products then cannot be used. And when we go organic, the literature, what they say is that we are going to lose some yields. As we mentioned before, humans, when they are in distress, then they're most susceptible to diseases. And the same is for plants. So you need to give them more space. And I feel it's really about management of soil, of water, using yeah, nature also to fight possible diseases. Like there are bacteria that can be sprayed on leaves and they control the rise of fungal diseases. I guess there's also... There's been talk about this idea of organic pesticides or, in this case, organic plant protection products. Some information you gave me from the European Commission covers some key rules for organic production, in fact, including products that relate to the seeds and the materials to propagate and process agricultural products, among others. But also a whole rule set for the process, including the prohibition of genetically modified organisms, GMOs, limitations to artificial fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, prohibition of hormone use and restrictions to antibiotics. There are also a whole range of farming strategies set up to maintain soil fertility, in fact, and farm health, such as crop rotation, choice of breeds, and cultivation of nitrogen-fixing plants. Could you delve a bit deeper on where plant protection products sit within these rules? There are molecules that are approved for organic agriculture, and they also act as plant protection products. I mentioned these bacteria most of the time, these solutions contain heavy metals. And these heavy metals, like uh, copper, they have been used for a long time on vineyards because they control uh, very well fungal diseases. And vineyards are very susceptible to fungal diseases. And the other way forward could be really controlling the environment where we grow our vegetables. And this is exactly what we also found in one of the catchment that we were monitoring the presence of greenhouses. Mm -hmm. So in greenhouses, you grow your vegetables, your berries under the protection of roofs. They can be very low-tech solutions and they're very typical of the Mediterranean areas. So they're just basically plastic tunnels and they exploit the sunlight and so on to heat up the environment as compared to the greenhouses that you can find in the north of Europe or in more colder climate where they yeah. use more glass for the insulation I guess to add that climate control element and the temperature control element to it exactly so you control the environment and so you provide the best environment for the plant to grow and thrive. You can control also the parameters that mitigate the rise of diseases. You can close the environment with uh, protective nets so that insects don't enter and so you don't have to apply insecticides. So if we have all these benefits that greenhouses provide, I mean, I guess you have to construct them and for large agricultural fields, this might become cumbersome in terms of cost, but why don't we try to encourage that a lot more? The upfront cost, of course, is a big challenge. But what I'm studying at the moment is that the pervasive construction of greenhouses, they actually caused floods in the catchment where they were being built. Wait, what? Yes, because as I mentioned, it's you get this plastic cover. Ah, yeah, yeah, because I guess by putting greenhouses in, your fields are no longer permeable. And so when rain falls, it has to go somewhere and it's not going into the soil. Exactly. The water cannot infiltrate anymore. And nowadays, if you walk uh, close to uh, greenhouses, you can see that they have pipes that collect the water from the roof. And this water is delivered somewhere. So in the catchment where I'm working now in the south of Italy, they found this solution. So they stored the water in uh, reservoirs, in ponds. They just collect it there and they have no return flow valve. And when the water level in the streams decreased to a certain threshold, they just open the valve again. So a bit of a control 
operation to help protect the downstream environments from the effects of, I guess, agriculture. Can we say that this is also very viable in an urban setting? Because I know urban agriculture is starting to become a thing or people are thinking very heavily about, you know, this. We used to always look at the separation between rural and urban and rural were the big fields of farms. But this no longer seems to be necessarily a viable or long-term sustainable solution. And so people are looking to the cities now because I can see this would minimize the transport costs. This would minimize a lot of the land uptake and space is, of course, scarce and allows us to then also provide, as you mentioned earlier, nature-based solutions to restore coastal areas or reforest certain areas. As an environmental engineer, I like to look at all the different angles of a topic. And I recently read a paper where they were just doing this kind of analysis and they show that growing food in greenhouses in southern climate, so in Mediterranean climate, cause the emission of less CO2 as compared of the production in greenhouses in northern Europe. Well, if you think about it, you need to heat up the environment in winter, autumn, and sometimes these are just huge spaces. You need to provide light. So I guess the energy factor is still a big issue. Interesting. Instead, if you grow in the south, also in winter, temperature can be mild and they still get sunlight. Mm. And so the plants can grow anyway. I have a thought experiment sort of swirling through my head as I'm hearing this, again, in terms of the urban agriculture aspects, because I always think I'm more focused on cities. So it's natural that I'm going to try and fit everything I hear and learn about in the city context. But you mentioning the heat situation, couldn't we perhaps trial this in urban areas? Because oftentimes through the urbanization effect, urban areas tend to be a bit warmer and maybe that heat can be somehow harvested and sort of funneled in a way to the greenhouses or it might reduce the costs of heating so that the plants can grow healthy. You know, I never tried, but sometimes I joke with my friends and we're like, why don't you connect a pizza oven to a greenhouse? Oh. <laughs> I suppose, yeah, you have to you have to heat up pretty high to get your to get a nice crust on your pizza. Exactly. And so I mean pizza oven, they work at four hundred and fifty degrees and why don't you use that, that heat to heat up the greenhouse? But yeah, if you think these greenhouses are really huge and in winter times in northern countries the temperature can drop below zero. So I'm really like how many pizza ovens we should use. Yeah. <laughs> so you're in part of a, you're really exploring this interesting phenomena now. And this is really the next part of your journey where you're on a Marie Curie Fellowship. And this is basically your focal point for the next few years. Yes, for the next few years, I'm going to work on uh, estimating what is the correct budget of water use in this protected environment because they also have other advantages. So being protected, basically you don't have the effect of wind. You can shield with particular paint that you apply on the roofs of your tunnels. You can shield the um, infrared component of the light. So the evapotranspiration inside the greenhouse is much lower. This means that you should use less water. Interesting link. And you can optimize then water use. Optimizing also the environment for the plant to grow, it means that you can grow more because you can start planting earlier and you can also keep on harvesting later. But one of the points that I'm already considering, but I will see how it goes in the next two years, is... I hope it's not growing pizzas on trees. (laughs) No, don't worry about that. Is that if we optimize all the processes, that doesn't mean that we should grow more than what the catchment can supply us. If you optimize irrigation, uh, so you will use less water to produce the same amount of food, but still the amount of water that the catchment will receive will remain the same or hopefully will not decrease due to climate change. But if you keep on producing because then your environment is just perfect for the plants to grow, I mean, at some point you're going to run out of resources. And I guess we are hitting the growth limits of our planet. Mm -hmm. We have to be a bit more careful about that or more efficient, but not necessarily more, I guess, overproducing and I guess overconsuming. Yes, right. You read a lot about sustainability in that respect. And I guess some of that inspiration comes into play in your work. But what are some of the the more broader thoughts around that? Well, of course, I read uh, quite a lot about food. And if I think that we can optimize food production, 
but I still read that we waste 50% of the food that we produce. I'm like, why do we need to boost the production? That's one thought. But also I have other interests. So, for example, I buy secondhand objects. If I want to get a wardrobe or something, it's plenty of websites that facilitate these exchanges. I read about cloth industries and what could be sustainable in that sense. And of course, they made also a platform for buying secondhand clothes as well. It's lovely to see that you practice what you preach. Far too often we talk a lot about sustainability, but then don't integrate those same principles into our daily practice. But wherever we can, one at a time, bit by bit, I think this is always nice to see. Yeah, we try our best, yeah. So you're on part of our... You've now gathered different skill sets. You've merged your two passions, the one on the one aspect for food, on the other aspect for water. And in a way, you've actually produced some really exciting outcomes that can really help us better do agriculture, in a way optimize, but not necessarily produce more. Have you already established your balsamic vineyard in your backyard or, or your, your balcony? I think vineyard requires a lot of space, so I don't think I can fit it now in my front yard. But a future plan at some point. Yeah, when you have enough money. With a greenhouse, of course. Of course. Hooked to a pizza oven. But I've never seen a vineyard below a greenhouse. Okay, but definitely hooked to a pizza oven. Definitely, to keep it warm. Especially in the winter. <laughs> no, perfect. And so if you think back to that moment in Modena when you told me the story about the riverbanks and the flooding and also the issue with the rodents in a way making themselves at home there. The need to protect biodiversity is also becoming a big issue and in a way you've exposed yourself a bit to nature-based solutions through this work as well as through some other projects that you were also part of. Where are we heading? How do we get to that point? Is there a magic solution for, in a way, addressing all these challenges at the same time through urban agriculture or just improved agricultural practices in general? Well, I believe that as you learn during this podcast, maybe I built like my background as a multidisciplinary journalist. And I'm interested in understanding processes and the sustainability limits to human practices and how all processes are interlinked with each other. So in my point, we still need specialists who are going to learn deep features of the different issues and sources and causes of the problems. But we still need these kind of figures that can uh, then link different aspects of the same topic. And maybe they can come up with an innovative solution, but it's not so new. It just comes from a different field. And I guess being the one to be able to connect the dots. That's really important, yes. Daniel, it's been a very exciting discussion. And I think I've learned a lot, especially about agricultural practices. Something that I've, I guess, taken for granted, but in a way have to also understand. And I think it gives everyone a good insight. I'd like to ask you a few questions, like I ask every guest, to hear from you what advice you can also give to our listeners as well. Starting with really what inspires you to get up every day and to do the work you do, especially when the time gets tough and you have to jump into different disciplines. I mean, you've gone from river engineering to agriculture. You've learned modeling. You've done remote sensing. You've done monitoring with all with different kinds of equipments and tools. Well, most of the people say follow your passion. I would say also follow your vocation. I remember when I was a kid, before going to school, I was always watching the animals of farthing food. And it was just the story of these animals that had to flee their homes because humans wanted to build houses. And so they decided to collaborate with each other to reach a protected area. And they promised to each other not to eat each other. And I felt like that was a sparking moment in my life. And I brought that with me ever since, like collaboration instead of competition and... I just use it every day. The excitement of being able to meet new people, collaborate with new people. Learn from each other, share experiences, grow together. I think that's what we need. Yeah, teamwork makes the dream work, I guess. Definitely. Especially in the multidisciplinary setting. Yeah, exactly. We need to have this big picture and see the different aspects. And yeah, it's really nice that you refer to this, also this key event or this key, yeah, is it a cartoon? It is a cartoon. If I remember well, uh, maybe it originated from the UK and France TV. I'm not really sure about that. I mean, I was just watching it when I was six. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely look it up and put it in the show notes. Who knows? Maybe YouTube has some clips of it as well for our listeners to nice. get a bit of an insight. Yeah. So if you had a magic wand, 
What's the one thing you would change? Ha, that's a tricky question, but I would go with, um, I would make money disappear maybe. Okay. If we had equally limited opportunities, we could be much happier. At least that's what I've seen or what older people told me. They always have this example. We had no money. We just needed a bowl and the road was empty from cars. There were no risks. We could just play with each other, laugh with each other, spend time until dawn, you know, and, and they were happy. Mm. And I don't know. I like to see it this way. They find that in a way, given your environment, the money often relates to the funding to do projects. Do you find that that is part of the constraints placed upon you? Because I guess you've journeyed through bachelor's, master's, PhD, and a postdoc. And I guess you've been on many different projects. And do you feel that is sort of where that link is? Yeah, that's why I said it's a, it's a tricky question because, of course, money are needed. And this is something that I saw also in my path. And on one side, maybe it was a good opportunity to learn many different aspects. But because I didn't have time and economic resources maybe to deepen what I was studying on a topic, and let's put it in this way, I was, let's say, following the money and new projects, then yes, you might reach this issue for creative postdocs who struggle to deepen a little bit what they just found, but instead they need to change a topic so that they can be funded. I guess if it disappeared, you'd have your ball and you can play till dawn and I guess really go deeper in a lot of the stuff that you like. Yeah, for sure. What was one of the most challenging situations that you have ever faced in your career to date and how did you overcome it? One of the challenges, but was also a lesson is to say no. In my particular case, I had to say no after I um, sort of gave my word for a postdoc position. But then for other family-related aspects, I had to change my mind. And I felt really bad. I didn't expect the other person to understand my reasons. But of course, we also struggle to maintain a balance between work and family. And in this instance, I prioritize my life. And I had to say no to a job opportunity. Yeah, I feel like we're often confronted with this and it's too enticing, often too easy to say yes. And we, we tend to you know, immediately do that when our gut instead tells us no, take a step back and think carefully about the implications of what a yes would actually mean. Exactly. And also a no. I mean, you feel like you disappoint people. But in the end, if you then you're not happy of your choice, I don't know, maybe you can hurt back. I guess the worst is disappointing yourself as well as others. And oftentimes I think it hits you harder than you know, the people around you. Yeah, makes sense. Well, thanks for sharing. And so you did mention the time management aspect and I guess what tips can you offer in terms of time management? How do you balance your professional and personal time? I'm learning, but I mostly follow uh, my wife's schedule. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I love what I do. And so for me, I don't count the overtime, basically. And if I can read one more paper, if I can start one more project, if I can be involved in one more activity, for me, it's not work. It's a hobby. It's a pleasure. But I still do need breaks. And uh, that's why I said I follow my wife's schedule. Uh, when she's home, we just spend time together, cooking, walking, chatting but if she's not around, you will find me with a paper in my hand. Yeah, and I guess the tendency to then get lost a bit in the world that you're in, given how close you've brought your childhood inspirations and childhood interests that have stayed with you throughout your career now in your current research environment. It's a sort of a reinforcement loop that you cannot escape. I guess, do you get reminded of your work when you look at your tomato plant? That's the point. I mean, you're like, how can I improve? How can I optimize irrigation if I irrigate? from the top from the bottom yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe the pizza oven may not be a good idea because it will also be a serve as another reminder <laughs> too many uncertainties there okay no definitely so what advice can you offer to young professionals starting out and wanting to get into your field hmm. one of the things that helped me the most was to picture my long-term goals and one of the sentences that I found on the internet, I cannot find the reference, is endure pain with patience. Of course, life is made of up and downs. But if you look at the long term, maybe the trend is going up. But in that precise time, maybe you don't see it where you're going. And so you need to have a reference that is very far away in time. I guess 
to adapt a common saying, the tomatoes are redder on the other side. There you go. There I you mean, go. From the seed to the fruit, it takes quite a long time. Yeah, Daniela, it's been a pleasure talking to you about this. And like I said, I've learned a lot as well about the very important topic that our world is facing and also its future potential, both in the rural and urban areas. And so thank you for coming onto the show to share your experiences. Where can listeners follow your work or get in touch? Well, I'm setting up a website for the Marie Curie project. Otherwise, it's easy to find me on LinkedIn or the institutional email address. And more information as well as links to some of the papers we discussed and projects, as well as balsamic vinegar suggestions in the show notes. Yes, just visit me also in Modena and I will bring you to the best shop. Uh, I look forward. But um, apart from that, I always give my guests the last word. So, Daniela, famous last words. One message for the listeners to take away from today. Ouch. Uh, answers typically depends on time and location as models. Um, but I would cite Confucius. A man is great not because he has not failed. A man is great because failure has not stopped him. Thank you very much. And thank you to you listeners for tuning in to this exciting and globetrotting conversation with Dr. Daniele La Cecilia. As mentioned, you can find links to papers, balsamic vinegar and cartoons in our show notes over at peterrmbach.com slash podcast. If you enjoyed this show and are looking forward to more episodes, please do subscribe or follow this podcast on Spotify, Apple Music or wherever you are listening from to be notified of the latest release as soon as it becomes available. I would be incredibly grateful for this as it helps me to reach a broader audience and, who knows, perhaps inspire more sustainable culinary and farming adventures or more productive gardens, balconies and pizza ovens worldwide. If you'd like to know more about me or my work in general, you can also check out my website at peterembach.com, my YouTube channel, Peter Marcus Bach, that's Marcus with a C, or follow me on Twitter at Peter M. Bach or Instagram at Peter M. Bach 87 if you have feedback or suggestions or just know someone who has an inspiring story to offer, please feel free to reach out to me on social media. The podcast intro and outro song is called Bucolia by Bureaucratic. Stay tuned for our next episode and next guest to hear how they are tackling the grand challenges.